This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In the year 2015, the Science and Security Board advanced the doomsday clock from five to three minutes to midnight. This is a foreboding reality. With the unchecked spreading growth of Islamic terrorism and the global proliferation of nuclear weapons from nations like North Korea, China, Iran, and Russia undeniably increases the peril of a worldwide conflict and consequently the very existence of humanity. The failures of political leaders around the world to hold each other accountable for undermining existing nuclear treaties and proceeding with the development of additional nuclear triads is a testament to the growing tensions and ominous dangers emerging in every corner of the world. International technologies are now jeopardizing the national security of nations around the globe. Cyberspace espionage, hacking, and the creation of the electromagnetic pulse bomb present a whole new definition to the word war. Mankind has clearly entered into a new dimension of military weaponry that does indeed threaten the whole human race. Where is this leading us? Are we headed for a rendezvous with destiny at midnight? Just how near is Armageddon? Well, stay with us as we explore those very troubling questions on today's edition of The Armor of God. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, hello, and again, welcome to another edition of the Armor of God. Good to be with all of you once again. You know, as we tried to portray in the opening, it's becoming quite obvious that we are living in some very dangerous times. Many people today are beginning to sense the danger growing around them. Circumstances, conditions seem to be closing in and becoming more threatening to the very personal lives of so many around the world. And fear is growing in the hearts and minds of so many due to the sense that they have that their lifestyles are beginning to get threatened by this growing danger that they seem to be recognizing. Look what's going on over there in Europe. Just recently, we heard about these terrorists, Islamic terrorists, going into a nightclub and killing over 130 people and a combination of others who were sitting out on sidewalk cafes being shot in cold blood or over in Nice where there were uh, people run over just like so much roadkill by a homicidal driver. A, again, another Islamic terrorist uh, running over, uh, what, about 80 people, killing them in, in cold blood and injuring over 300 folks. And an attack over in San Bernardino, a husband and wife team, a Saeed Farouk and Tashfeen, I think it was, Malik, who went ahead and killed 14 folks, again, wounding over 20 there. And in Florida, all over the place, I mean, Orlando, Florida, a homosexual nightclub called The Pulse, where about 50 homosexuals, again, were gunned down in cold blood. All terrorist attacks, my friends. All of these committed by Muslim fundamentalists connected to some kind of Islamic group, whether it was ISIS, whether, whether it was Al-Qaeda, uh, all men and women very committed, very committed to the destruction of Western society, the values and standards that the West stands for. And don't kid yourself, Israel's included in this, and that's well known by many of those groups in their rhetoric of wanting to just essentially eliminate Israel. Even some moderate Muslims, let's face it, would prefer Sharia law over the constitutional law that they are enjoying in the culture or country that they're 
embedded in. And if that weren't enough, we have saber rattling coming out of Southeast Asia over there in North Korea, where it continues to pursue nuclear delivery systems so that they can launch these weapons of mass destruction, along with Iran, who relentlessly continues to pursue the development of nuclear bombs and additional weapons of mass destruction regardless of the deal that they agreed to with the United States. And this is bringing people full circle and to ask the simple question, is Armageddon near? Is mankind on the eve of destruction? Will China and Russia perhaps combine their agenda to initiate a world war to throw the world in all kinds of chaos. Yes, people are asking as we portrayed in the opening, let me remind all of you, what time is it on the doomsday clock? Well, before we begin to address some of these questions, let me interrupt myself as we normally do to present to you our free offers. That's right, I want to emphasize the fact that they are free. They're two one-hour presentations on CD format. One is titled Last Days, the second one titled, How Near is the Day of the Lord? Both of these will complement the presentation that I'm attempting here to provide and will certainly add a lot more detail to the amount of information that I will be able to share with you here in the short time that I have. Dial that number now, 888-578-8791. Hit us on that website as well, www.cgi. Org. There's a lot more information there for your perusal consideration that will help you to continue in the development of your relationship with Jesus Christ and, of course, God our Father. And also, let me remind you of the website feature we have regarding a webcast service that we provide every week. All you've got to do is go to our homepage at that www.cgi.org address, hit on the link, and rendezvous with us every Saturday at the posted time that's there. You will notice that we will have that available to you. This is a live presentation prevent, uh, presented by a minister of the Church of God International and or a invited speaker, special speaker, covering some topic <clears throat> of world news and or of Christian living that should be very informative, helpful, and uh, ed educational for all of you. So go ahead and take advantage of that feature because we'd love to have you go ahead and uh, rendezvous with us when that's available on Saturday. So one more time, 888 8791 for those free offers as well as that website. You can order on that website as well and ask for the two one-hour presentations, one titled Last Days and the other one titled How Near Is the Last Days? And again, let me emphasize both are free for the asking. Now let's get back to the program here and what we were talking about with regard to people beginning to notice how close we are getting to what appears to be the Armageddon moment. And the question is, can we know? Is the Bible in any way, shape, or form able to inform us of the time, the day, the year of when, in fact, mankind will meet the 12 o'clock hour as the doomsday clock portrays. Well, let me turn your attention over here to Matthew chapter 24 for a moment. I want to bring your attention to verse 36. Verse 36 in Matthew 24, we read this, and the Bible is very clear about this. It says, But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So here the Bible is clear, and, and we're going to read another location that substantiates this fact. And, and it's important, I think, that we get this fixed in our mind, that no man knows the time or the hour. Only the Father knows. Now, there are signs, and chapter 24, by the way, Jesus himself provides some of those signs. But there are signs we can look to to begin to, as a barometer, reference, to give us a sense of when we're beginning to approach that time. And notice what Jesus says, because he continues on here in the narrative, where he says in verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now notice this. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. In other words, what Jesus is saying is life will go on 
in kind of a normal fashion. Now we understand in reading in Genesis, it was a very evil time. As a matter of fact, it was so evil that God at that time re was repented He even created man. And as we understand the story there regarding Noah and Mrs. Noah and his sons and the family and the boat that they built and put all the animals in, that God essentially wiped the grid clean and started over with those eight people. And so it is that when the flood came and nobody believed it, it came and drowned all of mankind. And Jesus is portraying the fact that much like that time, people will be very unaware, unaware, oblivious to what is indeed and in fact going on. They'll be just living their lives in normal fashions. Yes, it will be an evil time, but the fact of it is it will be indeed a very normal, oftentimes considered by standards, natural time. Now, the apostles themselves thought in their case as well, they weren't unlike us, that they too were living in the last days. Let me bring your attention over here to 1 Thessalonians for a moment. Over here, uh, the writing of Paul, where he mentions this in chapter 2 of, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians. He mentions this to indicate the fact that he himself had the notion that he was living in the end times and that Jesus would return in his day. Notice this, it says in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. And I want you to point out here, he's appealing for their attention by virtue of leveraging the day of the Lord. He fully expects that Jesus is going to return. And because Jesus is going to return, He wants their attention in describing what He's about to talk about and lay on them for introducing to them some signs that He believes are very important for you as His listener, as His audience, and in this particular case, those in Thessalonica, to hear him out with respect to these circumstances. Notice what he says here in verse 3. Let no man, Paul says, deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, that he as God sits in the temple of God. And let me remind you, he was writing in the shadows of the temple. I say that figuratively. My point being is the temple was still in existence when Paul wrote this letter. It wasn't destroyed by Titus for at least perhaps another decade and a half or so in 70 AD. Paul was writing this probably about 55, maybe 60 AD. So he fully expected this man of sin to enter into the temple and set himself up as God. He says here, remember you not, verse 5, that when I was yet with you, I told you of these things. And so it is today, my friends. You know it as well as I do. We have no shortage of people that bang the drum about the end times and who will use any item, any event that they can to leverage attention for their own self gain, sadly. And I'm sorry to say that, but oftentimes that's what it boils down to when the dust settles after all the events have come and gone. What am I talking about? Well, let's remember and hearken back to just the turn of this century. How about the old Y2K2 event? And then thereafter, following shortly, right after that, we remember the Mayan calendar event, the Mayan calendar situation where they thought because the calendar ended that the world was going to end, only to find out that Mayan scholars were attempting to try to tell everybody that, hey, you know what, it was just the end of a cycle. The Mayans weren't trying to imply or provide the notion the world was going to end when the calendar ended. It was just the end of a cycle. Or how about the hail bop comet? Remember that? And of course, the Heaven's Gate group who killed themselves thinking their immortal souls were going to get on the, the comet, I guess, to escape all the tribulations and horrific events that were going to occur on planet Earth. And of course, the blood moons here recently that uh, we all got excited about with regard to the lunar tetrads of 2014 and 2015. All of these events, my friends, 
all of these events have come and gone. And guess what? We're still here. We're still here. You know what really surprises me, though? That people still listen to these people who portrayed and prognosticated that all these things were the harbingers of the end time. And then the fact is, the end time doesn't happen. And you would think, well, then everybody would look at those people who advanced those ideas as being somewhat insincere, disingenuous, and leave their support when, in fact, they don't. It surprises me. I, I can't sometimes, I'm incredulous over the fact of why people just don't write off these guys that are charlatans and just basically trying to money grab from your pocket in selling their books and getting their faces on television. But they don't. And as I say, there's no shortage of people that have done this in the past. I could give you a list. As a matter of fact, I will. I'll go back now and give you a short list. Back to the 19th century, to 1844, a gentleman named Mr. William Miller. The Great Disappointment is what he's known for. He thought that Jesus was going to return in the fall of 1844. A guy named Lavoca, the founder of the Ghost Dance Movement, predicted that Jesus was going to return in 1889 and that the millennium would begin in 1890. How about the Catholic Apostolic Church, whereby founded in 1831, claimed Jesus would return when the original 12 founders would all be dead. Well, they all died in 1901. And guess what? Jesus did not return. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses who claimed that in 1914 Jesus invisibly began his intervention into world affairs to begin to make way his return to planet Earth and to take control of world uh, world issues and world conditions. A guy also named Benjamin Cream in 1880 or 19, I'm sorry, 1982 claimed that Jesus in that particular month of June on the 21st day in 1982 was going to return and go on television to announce his return. Now, when you think about that, you can't help but to think, well, now, wait a minute. If he's returning and going on television to announce his return, he's already returned. So how can he be going on television to announce his return? a little bit late because he's already returned, but that's another point. People, I guess, just don't think through those kinds of things. Jerry Falwell thought that Jesus would return within 10 years of 1999. Ed Dobson, Timothy Dwight the fourth, who was the president of Yale University along with Edgar Cayce and Isaac Newton, all taught and preached, advanced and prognosticated that Jesus Christ would return in the year 2000. And we all remember here just recently in 2011, Mr. Harold Camping, who was one that advanced the idea that Jesus was going to uh, return in October 21st. The rapture would occur uh, in May uh, 21st of 2011. And oh, the world would end, I'm sorry, the world would end October 21st of that same year. Ron Wineland, who felt and understood that he thought Jesus would return September 29th in 2011, changed his date to May 27th, 2012, and then changed it again to May 18th, 2013. Jack Van Impey has finally conceded to the fact that the dates that he set, well, he just stopped setting dates. And then, of course, Mark Biltz. And I've already mentioned the Blood Moon situation where we find, in fact, we're nothing more than harbingers of nothing. They were normal astronomical cycles called lunar tetrads. Lunar eclipses, four of them, six months apart, scattered, spread over two years. All these guys, my friends, serve to discredit, serve to undermine. They serve to cause the credibility of this very word to be lost in their own prognostications, and people become cynical about it. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Go over here with me just for a minute, real quickly, to 2 Peter. In the book of 2 Peter, we find the, the apostle saying and warning us how scoffers in the last days would come and find their way into attempting to try to influence those that had the faith in Christ's return 
to try to knock them off their faith, to try to get them to begin doubting the fact that, you know what, you've been saying Jesus would come back for literally thousands of years and he's still not returned. Notice here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 3, we read this. Knowing this first, this is chapter 3, verse 3, 2 Peter, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For, all, uh, for since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. I, I don't know what precipitated this writing from Peter, perhaps as a result of the apostles themselves thinking that they were going to see Christ return and as their lives began to end realizing that Jesus wasn't coming back in their lifetime, maybe generated some of the mocking that they themselves were experiencing. I don't know. But I do know this. The fact of it is, is that in spite of the scoffing, in spite of the doubting, in spite of the mocking, the fact remains you cannot dismiss, if indeed you believe this is the Word of God, you cannot dismiss that from Genesis to the book of Revelation, this book is loaded with information with respect to the return of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you just a few of these scriptures. I won't have a whole lot of time to do that, but I want to take some time to go ahead and turn your attention back to Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 29. Let me read this for you. Notice this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon it shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. You talk about blood moons, there you have real blood moons moons, not astronomical signs, supernatural signs that God is going to literally shake the heavens to get man's attention that something stupendous is about to happen. Notice verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and notice this, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory, and He shall send, at this time, His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. You could go to Mark. Let me go to Mark chapter 13. Notice this over here in Mark chapter 13. Let me bring your attention to this particular scripture. As I pointed out in Matthew 24, this is the sister uh, description of, a similar, of the same event. But in those days, verse 24, Mark 13, notice, After that tribulation the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. You can read the same over in Luke chapter 21 and in verse 25 through about 28 you can find the same story. Notice here though, I want to turn your attention. Notice this, this is, this is really exciting stuff here. In Acts chapter 1, in the book of Acts and in chapter 1, notice this, angels are now suspended in the sky. Jesus Christ has just ascended up back to the Father. This is after the resurrection. And here they state, and while they, that is the disciples, looked steadfastly, verse 10, chapter 1, book of Acts, toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Follow me over here to Zechariah chapter 14. Here's the Old Testament. Zechariah 14 and in verse 4. Notice this. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half that mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half that toward the south. And verse 9, notice this, and 
The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. There you have it. Acts corroborating with the prophet Zechariah, showing that Zechariah, before the book of Acts was written by Luke, confirms the fact that what Luke is saying corroborates, it agrees with it, kind of mesh, uh, uh, meshes itself and proves, substantiates both to be true. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives as he ascended back to the Father, so he's going to return in the latter day as described by Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and so many other scriptures. Revelation 19 is the very description of Jesus' return. So my friends, what is all this about? Well, let me turn your attention back over here to Mark chapter 13, because I want you to understand something. It's very important that all of us, as we begin to, to wait and understand that Jesus Christ is indeed and in fact returning, that we take note of what Mark tells us in verse 32. Notice this. But of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son of Man, or uh, Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. We don't know when the doomsday clock will hit midnight. We don't know when Armageddon is going to occur. But we do know this, the Son of Man is like a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Therefore, watch. Be vigilant. Be vigilant, my friends. Be watchful. Be awake. Don't become complacent in these last days as you begin to see the danger growing. If there ever was a time to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the time. Time's run out on me. Go ahead, dial that number right now, 888-578-8791. Ask for both of those one-hour CDs, The Last Days and How Near is the Day of the Lord. Both of those items are there for your asking, free of charge, as I've mentioned already. They will elaborate and go ahead and provide you with far more information than I was able to even touch on, because I was only really able to scratch on the subject today. Hit us on that website as well at www.cgi.org. And my friends, this is Bill Watson reminding you always as we often do, you keep on that armor of God so you may be able to stand in these evil days. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call 1-903-939-2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org, or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.